Welcome back to Debate Me, Coward. So you say you want a revolution. Well, you can count me out. Our guest today is George Lawson, author of Anatomies of Revolution. Now, unlike a normal anatomy book, you'll find no boobies here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, George. Uh, you know, recent years have seen renewed interest in the study of revolution, spurred by events like the 2011 Arab Spring, the rise of ISIS, and the reemergence of populism and nationalism. A new age of revolution has generated considerable interest. Yet even as empirical studies of revolutions are thriving, there's been a stall in theories of revolution. That's where George Lawson comes in. He is a professor at the London School of Economics and the Australian National University, whose book offers a novel account of how revolutions begin, unfold, and end. George Lawson, thank you for joining us today on Debate Me Coward. Pleasure. Now, George, I want to start by saying that I actually found your book to be very interesting, which is surprising because I actually try to not read history books because the only history book that I need is the Bible, which I have already read one and a half times. But I noticed that in your book, you didn't actually mention my favorite revolution that I remember that I actually lived through as a child, uh, and that was the Republican Revolution of 1994. Do you remember this? This happened here in America. Clinton had a stronghold on this nation, and then it was broken by General Newt Gingrich. He was leading the electoral right. front, and then Rush Limbaugh was on the cultural front, and it was just uh, an all-out assault. It was just an amazing time to be 12. Uh, now, more recently, uh, you know, you also didn't mention the Reagan Revolution before that. I think they kind of set that up. Or, very recently, the Trump Revolution of 2016, where the dictatorship of moderate, di of moderate Democrats was overthrown by the voice of the people. And then also the Electoral College helped. But now his election has been described as a radical break from the past, which mm. sounds very revolutionary. Now, if what I saw on liberals' faces that fateful election night wasn't a revolution, then I don't know what a revolution is. George, do I know what a revolution is? What's a revolution? Do these things count? It's, it's not that. It's not that. When it felt like that. <laughs> Uh, it felt like that, and some things do feel like revolutions, right? But that doesn't make it so. And I think the big difference between those examples you talk about, Reagan and Gingrich and Trump, and revolutions that uh, I study is that they all took place within an existing set of political institutions, within an existing political ecology. And they were radical, that's true, and they did lots of stuff. That's also true, and they changed the country. Thank you. Um, but that's not necessarily a revolution, right? That's just radical change. A radical change happens in lots of different ways. A revolution has to have that extra constitutional transgressive bit. It has to stand outside the law where people are putting themselves on the line in a way that's risky um, because that it is actually breaking the existing way of doing things. So you can have big changes that take place within a particular political system. And I think those are the ones you're talking about. And we might talk about Margaret Thatcher in the UK and a bunch of others. Right, lover. Uh, that we can come to, but that's not the same thing as we're seeing in, in Belarus right now, where you're going against the, ex the regime, you're going against the institutions, you're doing something that is not just risky, but also fundamentally uh, transgressive and extra constitutional, standing outside the boundaries of normal politics. Mm. Has to break the order. I think is what you're right. It has to break. Way. Well, it's got a couple of different things, right? So you both got to have this sense of radical, uh, radical challenge. Um, but you've also got to have this sense of a project that will make things hugely different. And that's, I think, the other difference between the examples you talk about and how we might think about revolutions over the last couple of centuries. And the revolutions aren't usually just about getting rid of a guy. It usually is a guy, or getting rid of a set of existing political institutions. It's actually about changing society. And to change society, you often change the way people relate to each other in a very everyday sense, right? Revolutionaries often uh, abolish existing uh, forms of belief. Um, the French streets, for example. right? Like, you know, in the French Revolution, they renamed a bunch of streets and plazas. You politicize it, right? You change the relationship between the church and the state. You secularize it. You might generate a sort of cult of the individual like Robespierre for the French or Mao for the Chinese or Lenin back in the day for the Russians. So you actually change the way that society is organized. You try and change how people, what people believe, although that's a really difficult thing to do. Mm. But the political side is actually the easiest, right? There's a sort of aphorism about revolutions that says you can take, you know, you can change your political 
institution. You can change a constitution in six months. You can change an economy in six years and you can change people's beliefs in 60 years. So we often concentrate a bit too much on the politics, not enough on those other things. Wow. Well, you know, uh, one thing that struck me right out of the gate with your book, uh, the opening sentence reads, there are two main ways of approaching the study of revolution in the contemporary world, and they are both wrong. Tell us, what are these dueling views of revolutionary history and why are they mostly bullshit? They are obviously bullshit because we confuse a couple of different things about revolutions, right? So on the one hand, we might have people that say, oh, look, you know, there's Reagan and there's Gingrich and there's these other figures like Thatcher or Trump or whatever. And, and look, they're doing revolutionary stuff because they because they often claim that kind of rhetoric. Right. You know, it, it, I mean, Bernie's the same, to be honest. I mean, mm. you sort of stand in take and him say, down, look, George, we take him down. We <laughs> Take it, take down both sides. Uh-huh. You know, there's this sense of it. this is kind of, you know, anytime you propose something that's not immediately standard, that you stand a little bit outside kind of normal politics or moderate politics, centrist politics, then suddenly you're a revolutionary. And that's not that's not the case, right? Like I said, it has to have this extra constitutional, really transgressive bit. I think just to start with, just as a challenge, let alone in terms of a program of a transformation of society itself. So I think the one hand, we have the first problem, the first bit of bullshit is just saying, look, anytime someone says something different, they're being a revolutionary. And we kind of lose the sense of what, what a revolution is like. I mean, if you look up, you know, you do various different searches on revolution, you'll find, you know, here's a new form of makeup. It's revolutionary, right? Here's mm-hmm. Elon Musk is a revolutionary. There's a kind of everyday sort of cultural politics of revolution, which is all rhetoric and all hot air and basically insubstantive. But what if it, the other problem? It, sorry, I just wondering, but if it, yeah, yeah. but something like that, if it truly broke the standard, like let's say makeup for like the inside of your mouth, it fundamentally breaks what your con- concept of makeup is. Is that then revolutionary? Yeah, well, it is in terms of a marketing trope, but I think it's very useful in terms of broader analysis, right? Hmm. I mean, they just you know. But revolution has all of these shorthand connotations, big change, mass movement, sometimes violent protest. And, you know, there's something to all of that stuff. But um, I think we need to take a little care and reserve it, as I said, for these dynamics that really try and do two things, both this sense of radical break and not just politics and not just in terms of people's beliefs and not just in terms of. Uh, how an economy is organized, but all of them simultaneously at the same time. And then what you're doing is you're trying to generate a new society. So it's got that twin sense of challenge or, you know, it's creative destruction, right? It's it's a twin sense of challenge and then construction at the same time across all of these different spheres of, of social life and human interaction. So that's the one problem, right? Just become, you know, revolution just is kind of this everyday word we use for a bunch of different stuff that right. we see. And it's a kind of marketing trope. The other problem is to not take it seriously is to think mm. that revolution kind of belongs to the past. There are no revolutions anymore and no real revolutionaries. So the book exactly sort of sets that up. Look, you know, there is, there, are, there is revolutionary stuff. We just need to be a little bit careful about where we find it. Gotcha. Well, I, I do want to stay on current events for just a moment because your book type discusses a type of revolution that's typically absent from the popular imagination right now, revolutions of the far right. We have seen a wave of right-wing populist movements across the West in recent years. Viktor Orban in Hungary, Law and Justice Party in Poland, Brexit, even the United Kingdom, maybe even Donald Trump. So how does, you know, the Nazi seizure of power differ from the Mm. Bolshevik October Revolution or hell, uh, the Russian February Revolution? Does the month in which revolution happens have an effect on how (laughs) it plays out, George? I don't know, man. Someone should do a project on that, right? I I think think it would be good. I sometimes ask students, you know, do you think revolutions are more likely in cold climates and hot climates and summer? And, you know, I think you can argue both ways, right? Summer, you can get out on the streets. It's not too chilly and all the rest of it. Maybe it's a little bit trickier in the winter. But there were protests in Ukraine, what, 2014 and then a decade before then, where they took place in a Ukrainian winter and people Mm -hmm. stayed outside for months. So there went that theory. But, you know, by all means, try and work that one out. I haven't (laughs) been able to. That's how you know the people really Um, want it. If they're willing to stand in the cold, they really want this change. Great point, right? And maybe, you know, when it's all warm, people are like, yeah, I don't know if I can be bothered. I'm just going to chill revolution today. Porch. Yeah, Sunday, maybe. <laughs> you know, I think there's there's something there, but I don't know what it is. The right wing point is really interesting, right? I think this is a big flaw in how uh, people like me have studied revolutions in the past. And they try to reserve them for, 
you know, self-declared sort of secular progressive movements, the French and the American and the Haitian, the kind of age of revolution stuff from the late 18th, early 19th century, sort of constitutional republicanism. Then socialism, which, you know, not both of you will agree, but a lot of people thought was a progressive movement through the 20th century, various anti-colonial struggles. It's been and squashed I think what they now, done, I think. As of last week, it's it, been completely squashed. I don't know. <laughs> There's a little bit of it still lurking around. I mean, look, do you believe, oh, I can't believe it from afar, but you know, the fact that you can use the word socialism in America and kind of get away with it seems to me pretty remarkable. I've been calling things wasn't... socialist and communist for the last 40 years, George. Yeah, but I'm not just saying as a right wing swear word. I'm saying that people are embracing it from the other side too. That is a, a, a startling development to me as an establishment it's, Democrat. Um, oh, it's just the youth. I don't care about that. Yeah, the they'll get over it when they get real jobs. Is Bernie young? I thought Bernie was like 110. <laughs> I thought so too, George, to be honest. In Vermont, never no one ages past 35 in Vermont. Maybe they do they do things differently up there, right? So you were talking earlier about yeah. – sorry. If you want to continue, continue. Yeah, but this right-wing thing is, a real, is really important because there's – I don't think there's any – academic reason to not study right-wing revolutions. There's a bunch of political reasons you might not want to, but that's, you know, that works in politics, but it shouldn't work in scholarship. So I, I think, you know, there are differences between fascism and Bolshevism, but is fascism revolutionary? Yes. And are some of these right-wing characters in the world today revolutionary? Yes. Interestingly, I don't think, I think Trump's a bad example and Brexit's a bad example because so far at least, you know, the system has held. There are checks and balances. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd like to put the New York Times out of business, but last time I checked, it's still publishing, right? Yes. Uh, same with CNN. You know, say people are on the streets, they're protesting and, you know, by and large, they're, they're able to do so. So, I mean, there is a pushback there against what Trump's been doing more so actually than Reagan in the 80s, let alone Gingrich in the 90s. So there's, you know, there's a back and forth in a democracy between radical currents of various kinds, but these checks and balance and in institutions tend to be pretty robust and hold. And I'd say the same thing about Britain. But if you look around the world at these right-wing populists, you know, Duterte in the Philippines, maybe Modi in India, maybe Erdogan, uh, maybe Orban in Hungary, you know, they really do challenge democratic institutions. They really do seek to overwhelm them uh, and eradicate them or erode them at the very least. And there, I think you can talk about something that's getting closer, at least, to revolution. But can you have a revolution? So I think Trump is just trying to, you know, keep America sane. You know, let's try and, like, just go back a few years. Can you have a revolution where you're like, let's just keep things the way they are. Let's stop rocking the boat. Right? Because there's a lot of issues that Trump's going up against, like global warming. Well, global warming isn't a thing. It's not real. Police brutality. Well, police brutality is not real. It's not a thing. It's just a few bad apples. So conservative revolutionary basically is what you're asking. Is it possible, George, and how do I do it? It's definitely possible to be a conservative revolutionary, but that's not the same as saying, you know, um, let's keep things the way they are. I mean, it's true. You could radically try and go back um, to the past and you might do so in a way that was transgressive and extra constitutional and radical and seeking to overturn existing order and all the rest of it. And then you'd be in business. I mean, maybe the closest example would be Iran. I mean, you'll love this one. Trump, let's do a comparison of Trump now and Iran in 79. I mean, what the Iranian revolution, the clerics tried to do was kind of combine quite a lot of sort of quintessentially modern uh, ways of going about things politically. They borrowed a lot from the French Fifth Republic and they were full of, you know, modern uses of technology at the time, tape recorders and a bunch of other different things and print media of various kinds. And they had, you know, quintessentially kind of modern techniques in terms of mass movements and, um, you know, big uh, symbols that, that made sense of existing conditions. On the other hand, a lot of what they were trying to do was to move things backwards, uh, often to some kind of romanticized or mythologized um, place that doesn't really exist. But there, there was this really interesting combination between the new and the old. And I, probably Trump's the same, right, in that sense, in that he wants, he claims to want to go back, or a bunch of Republicans around him claim to want to go back to when things were simpler and easier and all the rest of it. But the way they do that is hyper-modern, right? You think about the use of Twitter, you think about the way that they use uh, contemporary forms of media and so on. So it's never as simple as, you know, let's go back and let's restore a kind of conservative. It's always that, I think, double-edged dimension of, of going back, but going forwards at the same time, or at least being up to date at the same time as wanting to go back. Very interesting. I'm going to deep dive into this. I think maybe he could like, he needs a religious connection. Is that what you're saying? He needs, <laughs> his evangelicals need to come out as much as the Ayatollah was coming out during the Iranian revolution. And that's how we can make yeah, it happen. He he wants, probably wants to put the Bible the right way around, though, this time, right? At least. Well, you know, those books are tricky. You know, it's all leather. 
Yeah. When it's all leather, it's hard to see the cover. So now, y- you academic guys, you're always bringing up the French Revolution. Now, that's a big one, especially because it has the uh, imagery, the connotation that people think of with revolution. Les Mis. Yes. Uh, and I, I understand that, you know, because, you know, you're European. But in American schools, we actually learned that the only revolution that matters – and really the only revolution that, you know, you would know about until you were probably, I don't know, 12, is the American Revolution. Mm. You may remember this, King George. You remember this? So no, how, I don't. Oh, well, <laughs> he, was, he was a tyrant. And we, had, they had, yeah. we had to go make our own money. And so we did that in this land that, you know, may have had people on it. But anyway, uh, long story short, we won. So now... It doesn't seem to get the respect that like French, Chinese, Russian or Haitian revolutions get. You know, we didn't need to guillotine the rich or murder our landlords or kill all the white slave owning oppressors. We just threw some tea Mm. in the river and then, you know, uh, got a slight assist from France. And then uh, George Washington just took a boat uh, over the Delaware, I believe. And then that was it. George surrendered. So how does does the American Revolution factor into your analysis? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Why don't you like us? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a very good question. Thank Almost you. surprisingly. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, interestingly enough, uh, America doesn't play a big part in sort of studies of revolution around the world very much. And the reasons for that are actually pretty similar to what you're saying, is that it looks like a more limited or constrained revolution. And I think people therefore have a bit of trouble trying to understand what it is. Is it kind of anti-colonial uprising? Is it a bit of secession or is it really a revolution? If so, what kind of revolution it is? And the big issue there, I think, becomes property rights, in particular slavery, in that it doesn't seek to really overturn how the US at the time is is ordered in terms of its everyday interactions, in terms of its economy and so on. What it does do is something very radical politically, right? Something that has a big effect on France and Haiti and uh, the world more generally. So it's a strand of revolution that I think people, it's, an, it's another one that people haven't studied enough, actually. You know, not as extreme Thank as that you. right wing version you. mentioned, but the political, it's a kind, it's, what, the category I would say for America is, is that of a political revolution rather than a social revolution. And it's actually been, I think, much more important than people think. So there's all sorts of other events in the mid 19th century in Europe, one big wave of revolutions in 1848 called the springtime of nations. I mean, they lose, but the model there is really America rather than France. Then there's a big range of constitutional revolutions, so-called at the beginning of the 20th century in Iran, uh, you know, China, uh, Russia, Mexico, a bunch of places like that, which again, I think the model is more America than, than France. And then we get, you know, this sort of blending of revolution with various debates around civil rights and so on during the course of the 20th century. And I think that model becomes the really important one for the end of communism um, in East and Central Europe in 89. So, hey, America Revolution, 1776, the end of communism, 1989. And a lot of what we see today, Belarus, you know, Hong Kong and so on, I think the inspiration that they're taking is actually a lot to do with America. And it's really about political rights, political justice, political representation, and not quite that model that I talked about earlier about the big, you know, let's reorder society, let's ban this and do that and reorder this. It's much more based on on the political dimensions of this. So I think that current revolution that stems from America is not studied enough and is super important, particularly in the contemporary world. That's something I want to have my ghostwriters work on a book about this, I think. (laughs) Will you? Well, it does bring up an interesting point, though, you know, because uh, there is such a thing as, you know, revanchism, like trying to uh, restore an old empire. We talked about this a little bit uh, ago. But do you think that's uh, possible for the communist East, the former Soviet bloc countries? Like, it doesn't seem possible today, obviously, because we're in America. And like you said, America won <laughs> for now. But do you think we yeah. might see something like that in the future? That we might see some kind of return to what? A, a communist to, uh, uh, East Bloc or just like not not even necessarily communist, but just like a political unit within the former Soviet Union. Seems unlikely to me. Um, I mean, it's one of the you know what? It's one of the interesting things about revolutions. I mean, all revolutions fail, right? All of them. They don't all fail in the same way or for the same reasons, but they fail in the sense that they never live up to the expectations of those people that bring them about. And the revolutions of 89 that ended communism in East Central Europe, 
you know, what did they do? They bought lots of freedoms. Um, they bought all sorts of uh, capacities that people hadn't had before, from the music you listen to, to the food that you eat, to the travel that you can do, to how your politics is organized, to the opening of the markets and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. But 30 years on, I think, you know, people aren't necessarily thinking, wow, things are great. Things are hunky-dory. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons that lies behind the emergence of populism in East Central Europe, you know, Hungary, Poland and, and elsewhere, is that actually people want some much more straightforward answers. Um, the economy's not worked as well as they would like. Um, there's lots of things that have appeared there that uh, people are unhappy about. Lots of really smart young people have left and don't appear to want to go back. So, you know, revolutions don't, uh, you know, there's kind of romantic vision of revolutions that says, if only we could do this, everything's going to be great, whether it's a guillotine in the French case or something more contained in the American case, you know, your tea into the harbor and all the rest of it. They always disappoint. And so I don't think communism is going to come back. I think that's the last place in the world we should probably look for. It. It's probably more likely in the US than it is in, in the former Soviet Union. But you, now, we're making some news tonight. All right. <laughs> I'm saying either is likely, but you know we're talking right. about five percent versus nil percent. But that's not or one percent. It's not enough. And so, I, but on the other hand, if you're saying could there be forms of authoritarianism, the answer is definitely yes. Mm-hmm. You know whether that's forms of hyper nationalism or different types of populism or some you know settlement of of various kinds. I think that you know. Sometimes we think democracy is this kind of thing that in liberalism, or at least you know, one of the two of you will, that people kind of aspire to and are trying to get to and all the rest of it. I'm just not sure that's true. And I think people find their own you know, sort of assemblages of, of different types of political units and different types of economies. And I think what we're seeing is actually a sort of robustness of authoritarian forms of capitalism around the world. I mean, China's the, you know, obviously the huge example, right. but there may be others closer to at least where I used to be in, in Europe that, that may be stickier than, than people once thought. So you're saying that, you know, like, it's like, the, it's hard to break these forms, right? Cause you're, even these revolutions, they like eventually like fail, but they're not really yeah. breaking the larger capitalist order. And so on that, I would say that the Francis Fukuyama guy from the 90s, when he said, it's the end of history, baby, capitalism won. Yeah. It seems like that he's right, right? No one's going to be seizing post offices and railway stations. You know, Bernie bros are not going to bring the government to its knees one door at a time. Yeah. You know, Democratic governors. And that's sorry. I totally agree. And that's at least for the moment, right? I think that's why America provides this better model. You know, we're all capitalists now. So when you look at these revolutionaries around the world, or, you you know, you think about Black Lives Matter, they're not saying let's end capitalism, right? They're saying let's end police brutality. Mm -hmm. Well, but they are. Um, It's underneath it, George. It's underneath it. (laughs) It's not true. (laughs) Maybe so. And you know what? There probably are kernels of something new, right? If you look at little bits of intersectional stuff around race, if you put together ideas behind things like a Green New Deal, uh, you put us, you put, you ally that to uh, critiques that go on within feminist circles, within anti-racist circles, and so on. It may be that there's some kind of smorgasbord revolutionary movement appearing that will carry the same kind of weight as socialism once did, or Republican constitutionalism did in the 19th century. But at the moment, it's a bit bits and pieces, and it's a bit difficult to put together in any kind of coherent package. I think the bigger point you make is exactly right, actually, that if you look at Hong Kong, if you look at Belarus, if you look about protesters around the world, they're often talking about wanting things to be different in terms of their political rights, political justice, political representation. But they're not really, as far as I can see, making huge demands about how the economy should be fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. So I think there is really something to what you're saying. I'm not sure how Fukuyama it is, but I think it's a I think it's a good point. This is what I'm worried about, George, and what keeps me up at night is what if we do these things that the left keeps asking for? What if we defund the police? What if we pass the Green New Deal? And then they find out that a lot of uh, their problems and the things that were holding them holding them down and was hurt, they find it is hurting this country, is in the system itself. Mm. Well, then we have to keep moving forward and change the whole system. Mm. So it's best not to change yeah. anything and just deal with the card we're dealt. Yeah, I'm not sure that completely follows from the first point. But, you know, I, th- I think the interesting thing about lots of where this critique came from, um, I mean, if you think, for me, the two big events that generated radical movements in the West were Iraq and then the financial crisis, right? And I think both of them really came down 
to the same kind of point, which was we need to save democracy. We need to save democracy from excessive militarism and from excessive capitalist excess. So at the moment, I think they're working within the system in the sense they just want democracy to function as democracy is supposed to and not just be for the few, not for it to be an, an oligarchy of some kind or another, whether that's a corporate elite or a military industrial complex. So for, at the moment, I don't see that the second part flows from the first, right? I think there is a critique of the existing system about its corruption, about its nepotism, about its uh, the way that special interests operate. And this is not just in the US, this is really a, throughout the West. But I think what people are trying to do is actually enhance and deepen democracy in the face of these challenges rather than overturn it. So, you know, we'd have to play around about what we think the system means here. If the system is chronically for these people, unfair, unjust, and so on, and it and it's irredeemable, and it can't be reformed, then I think we're in the ballpark of, of revolutionary stuff. But at the moment, I don't see that. I think a lot of them are actually fighting still within the system to make it work as it's supposed to, rather than overturn it and start again. Right. And so, that's, well, one thing I was going to say is that, uh, you know, uh, some evidence for the fact that people are not necessarily in a radical mood is COVID-19, Right. You would think, especially in the American context where, you know, before Congress put together uh, a relief package at the last minute early on in the pandemic, you know, it was feeling a little revolutionary around. A lot of people lost their jobs, like 30 percent unemployment. Right. So why do you think COVID-19 has had such an impact on the collective psyche as it perhaps could have? You know, a lot of people out of their jobs, a lot of people forced into a new way of living suddenly. Is it the twelve hundred dollar check? I think it was a twelve hundred dollar check. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's it is pretty early to say. Um, I think that COVID could do a couple of different things that push in different directions. One is it strengthens the state in the short term. Mm -hmm. You know, there's states of emergency all over the place. There's all sorts of restrictions on what people think they can normally do. Um, I'd moved to Australia a little while ago and there was a Black Lives Protest movement that wasn't allowed to take place in Sydney that otherwise would have. And the rationale for that was COVID. Uh. So around the world, I think COVID, you know, is a is a form of rational is a form of legitimation for states to do the stuff that states like to do, um, which is largely, you know, keep people in order. On the other hand, your point about COVID demonstrating when particular states are not functioning well and that that may heighten people's sense of unrest and dissatisfaction, then I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the U.S. state has not handled COVID well. And no. you guys may disagree on that but around oh, the world. That's a, the, I think that's 90 percent of people are going to agree with that, right? Maybe higher. And so if you've got a people that are already pretty pissed off with with how they think policing's operating, the hold of corporate interests where they think mainstream politics is going, then that probably emboldens them. Um, because they're seeing a state that's not functioning and protecting its citizens and doing what a state is supposed to do. So remember, the thing I think people forget in revolutions is that two things have to happen. We concentrate a lot on popular unrest, right? We see people in the streets, Hong Kong, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Belarus, etc., and we think that's a revolution. But something else has to happen, which is the state has to be toppled. And to do that, the state itself has to weaken. The state has to fracture. Uh, so it's never going to happen under this president because he's strong. Couldn't be more strong. Well, I think it's actually much more likely to happen under this president um, than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and you're already seeing that, right? You're seeing, you know, the idea, you know, bits of the deep state or the, you know, the mm -hmm. judge. You know, parts of the military establishment saying, you know, we're going to uphold the Constitution. I mean, there's something pretty radical going on. At least I can't remember in my lifetime in U.S. politics. I'm sure it happened in the 19th century. I think you're referring to the fact that Trump's so, going to reveal the deep states to be a bunch of uh, godless pedophiles. Yeah, and if he does that, you know, let's see what they do as a result, right? <laughs> um, you may find exactly what you need to have a revolution exactly happens, which is parts of the state go walk about. You know, they just say, look, we're not backing this guy. The state is more important than an individual. We're removing ourselves from, from our support for this guy. We support the Constitution. We support the United States. We don't support a particular individual that's seeking power for his own gain. So that makes – it's actually a really good illustration that if you had a Trump in a different country – you'd be much more likely to see revolutionary stuff. Revolutions are much more likely to happen in personalistic regimes where the guy effectively says, and again, it is almost always a guy, which is why I use that language, they try and take too much power. It's all personalistic. It runs through them. When things are going well, that's fine. When things are going badly, it's on them. And if bits of the elite then remove themselves from the individual and go, look, 
I'll try my luck somewhere else. In particular, if the coercive apparatus, the military, the security services and so on go, you know what? We're not supporting this guy. We're either going to return to barracks and stay neutral or we're actively going to support an opposition. Then the game is up. So actually, I think sometimes the popular protest bit is less important than hmm. what's happening in the state and what's happening in the type of state you have and what's happening particularly in these personalistic regimes. So how do you be like a leader and you want to be big and strong and everyone tells you that you're big and strong and you want to be like the best, biggest leader that you can be, but also have people like you and not turn against you? Are there, do you have examples that you studied of like where someone was able to have this I don't want to say that. I don't like the word cult. What, a jerk ass who had support despite being a jerk ass in history? Is that basically what you're asking? I wouldn't call Trump a jerk ass, but yes, George, <laughs> is there? The jerk ass theories of politics? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of these people, right? And often they stay around for a long time. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, basically until the last couple of centuries, I mean, every every country, every empire in the world was run by a particular individual and they sustained themselves by saying, look, you know, we're the son of God or we're a universal empire or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And how they stay in power is a mixture of reward and pain. You know, you parcel out offices, you pay people off, you include them where you can, you kill your enemies, you fight a bunch of wars to try and make sure that, you know, um, you're uh, extending your state or protecting it effectively. And, you know, sometimes it was stable. Sometimes, you know, you had Elizabeth I in Britain who ruled for however long it was, a long time, or Victoria. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it was really short term. Sometimes you'd have these periods where, you know, someone was killing, you know, a rival every two minutes. So democracy is, is stable, right? It's much more stable than that personalistic style because the personalistic style only endures as long as the person can hold together these networks, you know, and the networks are often about family. They're often about, like I said, a mixture of kind of reward and pain. But at some point, you know, people may think that they can actually maintain their place in the system, their rewards through someone else mm -hmm. that this person, you know, we can give him up and actually it's more likely that we'll stay in power. So I think there are two different examples you can think of. So if you think about the Arab uprisings in 2011, at some point, the network around President Mubarak in Egypt gave him up. They just said, you know, this guy's too unpopular. If we want to stay in power, we're going to have to let Mubarak go. And sure enough, that's what happened. And then there was a sort of counter coup a couple of years later that, that meant all politics was back with a bang. But the opposite example is Assad in Syria, where you had exactly the same, maybe even a stronger mass movement against the guy. It looked like he was going to go. But effectively, the military just said, no way. You know, without Assad, we're nothing. Uh, we'll lose out. So we're going to kill our own people. And that's one of the brutal truths of revolution that we sometimes forget is that it's one thing to have a protest movement, but it's another thing to actually break the state. And to break the state, you need people within the state to fracture, you need the elites to break up, and sometimes you need backing of a, of a foreign power of some kind or another. So it isn't an easy equation to line up, which is why we have a lot of revolutionary movements, a lot of revolutionary situations, but not that many successful revolutions. Right, but so one thing- you also say that Assad kind of lucked out because, you know, he's breaking the Geneva Conventions and he's using chemical warfare, but then the UN and no one wants to remove him from power. Which I think we, we would have if you, we didn't have Iraq and Afghanistan. We and Libya. Have, and Libya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lib and also Yemen. We're in Libya. I, don't, you know, I think it's an open question whether he could have been removed anyway, right? Because there's a second part of this, which is one, you know, what happens with these state actors, particularly the bad guys with the guns or good guys with the guns, depending on your point of view. Right. Good guys. But the other thing is he had a powerful international actor, right? He had Russia behind him. And then he had Iran behind him and then slightly, you know, more quietly China. And Libya was really important there because effectively those powers said, you told us there wasn't going to be regime change in Libya. You tricked us once, you don't trick us twice. Mm -hmm. And there were other reasons that Russia, you know, didn't want to give him up. They had their uh, you know, particular port that they didn't want to lose. And they were worried about what would happen if he wasn't there. And same with Iran, right? He was one of the only allies that Iran has in the region. So international politics matters too. In fact, if I had to put it in order, I'd say, you know, if three things that point you to a successful revolution. One is international politics. Who are your friends? Who are your enemies? Your enemies going to, you know, going to back up their guy. Is the state going to fracture, particularly what's the coercive apparatus going to do? And only number three, uh, revolutionary protest, right? If you've got people on the street, you know, are they good at what they do? Do they sustain their protest, even if it's super cold over a long time? And I think we spent far too much time on number three and not enough on one and two.
Mm -hmm. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit to focus on the word itself, because the average person today is more likely to hear about a revolutionary new breakfast cereal than a band of militants roaming the countryside demanding regime change, right? And in the book, uh, you have a story, uh, or at least an examination, uh, where you take a look at revolution domain names across different countries. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You want to explain a little bit about that? And did you find any, um, you know, uh, interesting tidbits on when this divergence in how we use the term revolution might have occurred? Uh, you know, say in advertising where we see it so much today. I think I, I mean, I, I haven't. I just strongly suspect it's the '90s. You know, I blame the '90s for a lot of stuff, New Greenwich and all the rest of it. But I think it was probably there as well. I think probably um, it was. You know, if you think about it, related to events, it was probably those big mass movements in '89, the end of communism in East Central Europe, that confused people because they didn't look like revolutions before. Revolutions before looked like Cuba or China or Russia or whatever. They looked like violent protests where you seize the state by force and then generate some kind of big change uh, after it. Mm -hmm. And I think they confused people in 89 because effectively they just got the keys handed to them, right? I mean, a lot of people showed up, they occupied public places, they had cool slogans, they wore funky clothes, you know, they did all that stuff. But they weren't a guerrilla force. I mean, they weren't an illegal party that had been operating in the shadows for a long time and their message was effectively you know we want to be like the west hmm. you know we want we like bruce springsteen you know inexplicably we like levi's you know even more inexplicably you know i remember going to moscow in 1990 and the queue around the block for the first mcdonald's was extraordinary and it was even more extraordinary because it was happening right right next to lenin's mausoleum which was just you know oh, around really? the corner from each other so you had a yeah, bizarre juxtaposition. By a burger of, and shove it yeah. in his face, shove it in his dead exactly. bomb face. I, you know, people may have actually done that. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's probably what confused people. They effectively wanted to, to be like an existing way of being. They wanted to be liberal. They wanted to be all the different things that that means. They wanted to be democratic. They wanted to travel. They wanted the clothes and the music and all the rest of it. And the fact they did that peacefully and the fact that the old regime effectively gave up without a fight, I think that's where you get the contemporary confusion of, of what revolution means and what it looks like. And you're right, I do these domain name things around the world. I mean, it might not surprise you, right? In the US, if you look at revolution.com, uh, I think it's an investment um, group of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, Aim to be. I mean, why you'd want your? I don't know. Would you want your investments to be revolutionary? I don't know. Maybe you would. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. In yeah. Britain, it's a software company. It's a gaming company. Oh, cool. And in Australia, it's a pet treatment. And that one just baffles <laughs> me. Why you would want, you know, your worming treatment for your dog and cat to be revolutionary is is bewildering to me. But there it is. You can people can try this around the world. You know, try your domain name, see what you find. I'm going. I'm going to. That sounds like a good way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Uh, George, there you go. in your book, you kind of also mentioned this. Uh, you have a case study specifically of 2004 in Ukraine about revolutions being kind of different than what most people would think of them and being like actually like fun in a way. You said that yeah. they used a decentralized structure, fluid leadership, and rather than being orientated around the social question, notions of left and right or vanguard parties, there were mass movements that mobilized, at least in part, through marketing campaigns, music, and yeah. pranks. As one of the leaders yeah. of Oddpour put it, a central part of its strategy was an ethos of laftivism. The idea was to make yeah. regime change fun. Yeah. I actually found this. I mean, some people might read this and be like, oh, that's kind of cool. And like, oh, they're thinking outside the box. I actually found that we are seeing this now in America where you have TikTok thing built on music and pranks, a social media platform from China that is undermining the president. And I think it's going to make our children think that communism is fun. Should be worried about making revolution revolutions fun. No. And yes. Um, <laughs> no, in the sense that uh, one thing that authoritarian, narcissistic, personalist characters mentioning no names donald trump really don't like you forgot to cough to sir you forgot to cough um i apologize <laughs> see if you can edit that bit in but they just hate being ridiculed right they hate it and you know this is the true of all of these characters around the world it's true of all of these characters in world history so if you're trying to prick away at the legitimacy of someone if you're trying to you know erode 
their claim to be, you know, the strong man, then making fun of them is a really good way of doing that. And those Serbian characters you quoted did that with Milosevic and he absolutely hated it. And they, he had no idea how to deal with it, right? He can deal with people who take him on in a kind of, you know, bout of rhetorical fisticuffs, but what he can't stand, or he, Milosevic couldn't stand, and I think the Trump could either, is people p- poking fun of him. So on the one hand, as a, as a tool for revolutionaries, I think it's not something to worry about. On the other hand, if you think revolution is just having fun, then you've got a problem, right? And I think a lot of movements in the contemporary world spend a bit too much time thinking, let's go and have a laugh. Let's like this particular, you know, Facebook group. Let's, you know, get on Twitter and and shout a bit and let's, you know, maybe join a protest uh, for a while. But revolution is a serious business. You know, people are people around the world lay down their lives for conditions of extraordinary exploitation and injustice. And this kind of challenge that you present to existing authority and the type of movement you're hoping can generate a new type of of society or at least a new type of political order is a serious business. So by all means, you know, let's have some fun. Let's erode the legitimacy of these characters. But at some point, you know, the revolution's got to turn serious. That's right. Yeah, I think the the serious thing now is that I don't think we need a revolution in this country. I also think it's mean to make fun of a leader. I think it's cruel. (laughs) Oh yeah, I'm but sure. this country is almost almost yeah. perfect. As soon as we just get rid of Joe Biden's America within our America, we'll be a lot better. Now, before we wrap things up here, George, uh, it's one more thing I wanted to touch on because you know you have a background in history and you really helped uh, illuminate a lot of you know the global perspective on revolutions here. Uh, just curious about like your favorite history book. For me, it's uh, you know I don't know if you ever read Killing Lincoln by Bill O'Reilly. Cherry to the God, or is that a history book? It's a fiction book. Right? He has a, a bunch of it's like killing MLK, killing Lincoln, killing JFK. Alternate alternate history, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, oh, I had a history book that I still keep from my sophomore year, where I drew this badass picture of Ronald Reagan shirtless riding an eagle on the back cover. That's probably one of my favorites. Wow. But what is one Putin? Of, I think what Putin must have seen that picture at some point and copied it. I just suddenly <laughs> seeing this overlap between the two. Ronald Reagan is more of a man than Putin could ever dream of. <laughs> can he wrestle as well? Oh, Putin Ronald, likes to wrestle. Oh, Ronald in, Reagan can in his wrestle. younger days, yeah, I think so. Oh yeah, his younger days. Uh, but is is there any like a book in history that kind of like you know? inspired you inspired you and yeah you thought like really like put things in perspective in like a good way where you're like oh this book really like gets it and like you know has a narrative that feels very real oh man that's too that's a huge question i mean i do think i guess to turn serious for a second that anyone interested in revolutions listening to this you'd be better off reading some history that's the best thing you can do is try and contextualize what's going on today with what movements have done in the past. I think there's a real, there's a kind of twin edge dimension to revolution in the contemporary world, which is it's back. And to some extent that's good. I mean, it's good for me because it keeps me in business and keeps me off the streets. It's good because, you know, there are conditions, terrible conditions around the world that people fight against. And one of the indirect consequences of revolution isn't necessarily that you win or lose. We already mentioned that all revolutions fail, but actually the often revolution for just asks, gets people asking good questions, gets people mobilized and often leads to pretty powerful reform. So, you know, there may not have been a socialist revolution in, in parts of Europe where I grew up, but socialism as a force, I think, generated quite a lot of good in terms of the emergence of welfare states, the opening up of um, uh, the vote and things like that, that I don't think elites give away powers easily. And I think sometimes they've got to be challenged to do so. And some of the real positive effects of revolution is indirect rather than direct. So I would just urge people to read history and think about movements that you've seen before, what they've done well, what they've done badly, where they've succeeded, where they failed, and try and put contemporary movements uh, in perspective in that respect. So like, read my book. Oh, yeah, definitely. Look at the reference. Read The Anatomies of Revolution. Yes. Yeah. But also uh, in your Amazon card, also add The Art of the Deal. Because I think that's a revolutionary book because it tells you how to negotiate with people, how to, you know, compromise and get ahead. Revolution is about not negotiating and not compromising. That's the thing. Or no, just, well, it's, yeah, I mean, at least. What if you lead with, we're, we know we're going to fail. So let's talk it down. Yeah. Let's talk it back. But you don't have a favorite history <laughs> book, George? Are you like one of those like authors who doesn't read books? Like a musician that doesn't listen to other people in the genre? Uh, he says he's got too many. 
Exactly. I wouldn't go that far, right? There's just too many. Spending. If I were seriously had to mention one that's coming to um, coming to mind, there's a British historian uh, who died a couple of years ago called, called Eric Hobsbawm, mm. and he wrote this amazing, I think, trilogy of the 19th century, and revolution's a key dimension of it. And he traces the way revolution shifted over the course of the 19th and then 20th century. So I think he gets up to, I don't know, the 1990s or something, and then he got a bit too old to extend the story. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a pretty good place to start. And you know, they're called, I mean, they got one's called the Age of Extremes, one calls the Age of Empire, and one's called the Age of Revolutions. How about that? A trilogy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. That seems like a good recommendation. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you another personal question, George. What's your favorite mm. revolution? Because for me, it's none. We just all vote for the lesser of two evils and trust that in 50 or maybe 100 years from now, we can all be grateful that things are slightly better. So what's your favorite revolution? Just personally. It doesn't have to be a successful one. Just like, you know. You know what I think is the most interesting one? And at least one of, actually, in fact, both of you are going to hate me for this. But I think the most interesting one for me is Iran in 1979. Mm. The reasons traitor. that I talked about. I, you know, Mr. Trump, you should like this, right? Because it's this mobilization of, of religion and conservatism and back to the past with highly modern techniques of various kinds. But I think it's super interesting because of this mixture of the old and the new and really, really <laughs> weird synthesis between Shiism as a sort of rediscovered type of religion with bits of French republicanism. And then because I think it acts as a segue between the old and the new models of revolution, that it pioneers nonviolent movements, 16 months of mass movements, millions of people on the streets, on the streets protesting against a regime that was back to the teeth with um, you know, high military capability and coercive power. And they won. Um, and it's a kind of remarkable story of mass protest, nonviolent movement, new and old religion and and republicanism. And I think that mixture is is just a fascinating blend um, that's very difficult to make sense of and all the more interesting when you can give it a go. Wow. You've definitely sold me. I think I'm going to study this because I think there's – From my Wikipedia list now. Well, there's still time for Trump to save his campaign. I'm going to write a link. I'm going <laughs> to pull some lessons – is look at Iran. He needs to grow a beard, I think, is ultimately... Sir, <laughs> sir, please. I don't think he could. What? It'd be a really weird orange one. Can you imagine? That's not going to help. No, 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 no. You used to, have you ever, there's a meme photo that floats around, especially in my circles, where he has a shaved, bald head and a beard, and he looks amazing. Wow. He looks like an action star. <laughs> I find that very difficult to believe. I've got to go, guys. There's people just outside the door. Okay, well, we want to thank you for coming on the show, George. <laughs> Pleasure. Super fun. Um, so, listeners, go revolutionize your shopping cart by getting Anatomies of Revolution by George Lawson. Now, as always, this interview is brought to you by Revolutionary Snuggie, the most advanced gravity blanket you can buy on Amazon. Get ready for the comfort revolution, or we'll kill your family and send you to the gulags. Thank you a lot for being here, George. Uh, the book, again, is Anatomies of Revolution. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.